This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. When we order something online, we usually only see the package for the final 50 feet of its journey, if at all. But that package has potentially started its journey on the other side of the world before eventually winding its way through our city and then getting to our doorstep. But even that final 50 feet is critical to urban goods logistics and can be affected by city planning. It can account for 25 to 50% of the supply chain cost for delivering an item. And that cost is only going up as more people shop online. No surprise, but the pandemic has spiked demand and now 20% of spending happens there. All these pieces of delightful transit-themed swag need to get delivered. But as more deliveries are happening, there isn't more space on roadways for trucks to park. This is less of a problem in your suburban areas, like when your FedEx driver drops off a package. But in urban areas, you get trucks jockeying for position with other trucks reprovisioning shops and restaurants. What can cities do to make sure you get your swag on time while ensuring that restaurants get their fresh produce and shops get their goods? This is a real problem. Luckily, there are places like the University of Washington's Urban Freight Lab working on solutions. Here's a few ideas they've tested and found to be successful. First, and this is probably no surprise to delivery drivers, but cars park in marked delivery zones even though they shouldn't. In turn, this forces delivery drivers to park in unauthorized areas. The result is inefficiency and gridlock. The answer to this problem may be scrapping the division of parking spots by use, but instead dividing them by time. Most deliveries can be made within 15 to 30 minutes, so removing loading zones and adding more short-term parking could reduce confusion and ensure deliveries get to where they need to go. This is a critical need because in many areas, loading zones are 90% occupied during peak times. Second, there's a lot of time wasted for parcel deliveries as drivers drop off packages to individual units in a building. It can also lead to missed or incorrect deliveries. The failure rate can be as high as 15% in some places. The Urban Freight Lab piloted a shared delivery locker in the Seattle Municipal Tower, a 62-story office building that's home to Seattle City Hall and other offices. Delivery drivers simply deposited packages in the locker, similar to Amazon lockers, instead of individually delivering packages using the freight elevator. The lockers reduced delivery times by 78% and eliminated failed deliveries. Finally, buildings can be built with loading docks. This reduces the need for parking spaces on the street or in alleys and can make it more efficient for delivery drivers to load and unload parcels. The average delivery truck spends 9 minutes looking for parking in Seattle and 15 minutes in New York City. Docks are ready-made parking spaces drivers don't have to hunt for. Yet these docks are very rare. Only 13% of buildings in the city of Seattle have them. Making these changes can have some profound impacts on how cities function, especially in dense areas. While some delivery carriers are switching to electric vehicles, the full transition will likely take years or decades, so reducing idle time and searching for parking can reduce carbon emissions. Traffic could improve too, and that means you'll get your delivery faster, which is never a bad thing. I've just described changes cities can make at the last 50 feet of delivery, but what about the last mile, and at the gateway to a metro area, like an airport, seaport, or rail yard? We'll get into those after the bike bell. The last mile is one of the most expensive and challenging parts of any parcel's journey. It isn't literally a mile, at least not usually, but meant to mean the distance between a local distribution center and the parcel's final destination, like a house or business. It's a major focus of urban freight logistics because up to 75% of the delivery cost of a good can come in that last mile. It's also where local governments most often interface with the global supply chain network. The primary conflict point centers around trucks. Getting trucks in, around, and back out of an urban area without causing excess air pollution and traffic is a challenge. So what can cities and city planners do to ensure the smooth movement of freight throughout a city? Let's start at the distribution center. Cities should zone land for logistics facilities in places where freight arrives in an urban area. Gateways like harbors, airports, and highway interchanges. The upside is most people don't want to live near those land uses, so it's no problem to zone for industrial uses. It's less straightforward to get those goods from the distribution centers into dense cities. Maybe the answer is getting rid of trucks entirely. That's why you saw companies like Amazon invest in drone delivery services. Packages wouldn't be stuck in traffic and creating traffic, but could instead zoom above it all and land in your backyard. Of course, many people don't have backyards, it's a challenge to land those drones, and airport regulations make them tricky to fly in many areas. There's a great Wendover Productions video on this topic, it's really worth your time if you want to learn more. It doesn't look like drone delivery is coming anytime soon, but Amazon thought last mile logistics were so hard they put resources into flying packages to people. That tells you something. The more practical alternative to trucks and drones is bicycles. FedEx, for example, has been rolling out cargo e-bikes in cities across the world 
to ease costs associated with congestion and parking in dense areas. They are also a perfect fit for cities with low emission zones. One study of cargo e-bikes found they can actually be more cost effective than trucks if the route is less than 6 miles, with 10 parcels being delivered at every stop. This can't easily be achieved in the suburbs, but it's perfect for dense urban areas. Drivers also enjoy not having to worry about parking and holding up traffic. Some delivery services will take a single truck and deposit all the parcels in a central location in the center of the city and have them delivered by bike, or even on foot. International carrier DHL even hired joggers to deliver packages in London during the 2012 Olympics when trucks were not permitted to make deliveries due to congestion concerns. Cargo bikes and joggers aren't going to work everywhere, and trucks can move a lot of packages at once. They aren't going away. Instead, cities can regulate where they drive to minimize negative impacts and perhaps even speed up deliveries. The obvious answer here, and the one you probably already heard about, is truck routes. But, at least here in the United States, truck routes are more about reducing wear and tear on local roadways. The federal government and state governments have a list of truck routes, which include all federal highways and most state highways. But at the local level, cities will require trucks above a certain weight to stay on approved roads designated to support high volumes of heavy vehicles, until that vehicle needs to make a direct pickup or delivery. Here's an example from where I live. You can see all the streets in the truck route listed, and the requirement that trucks above 5 tons stay on those roads. That's not to say that cities don't use truck routes to influence where trucks can travel. Of course, truck routes generally connect to major freight and logistics centers, as well as industrial areas that send and receive large shipments regularly. But truck routes are often designed with wider lanes to accommodate wider trucks, which aren't a good fit for dense urban areas which often prioritize pedestrians. How can those areas allow for truck traffic? One possible solution is called the traffic cell system. A central area is divided into quadrants, and there's only one way in and out for cars in each cell. If someone driving wants to get from one quadrant to another, they have to use the ring road. They can't pass through. This discourages driving, slows down traffic, and encourages transit use. That system can also be used to overlay truck routes into areas of a city, a separate entrance and exit for trucks, and routes meant for deliveries can reduce conflicts with cars and speed up freight trucks. Bremen, Germany, for example, implemented traffic cells decades ago, and Barcelona's superblocks are a different take on this old idea. A less radical approach is to separate cars and trucks in time instead of space. Cities will encourage trucks to make deliveries early in the morning or late at night, often by reserving parking spaces for commercial loading at off hours. Trucks can then avoid rush hour traffic, which is a killer for on-time fast deliveries. Early and late deliveries can work, but many smaller businesses can't afford to have an employee on site at 4 a.m. to receive shipments. It's one strategy, but like so many complex urban problems, there is no silver bullet and a buffet of strategies will be needed. The last mile is a challenge for logistic companies and cities, but what about beyond that last mile? This is where the relationship between freight and cities starts to change. In the last mile, cities will impose their will on freight, but at the scale of a seaport or rail yard, freight imposes its will on cities. Most of the world's largest cities exist because they're in a convenient location to import and export goods, mostly by sea. One of the reasons New York City is the largest in the United States is because local boosters and business interests push for the Erie Canal, which made shipping inland goods to New York cheaper than places like Boston and Philadelphia. Today, places like the Port of Los Angeles form an essential part of the region's economy. That port supports over 500,000 jobs in the area, and it handles 20% of all cargo moving into the United States. It surpassed San Francisco as the busiest port on the West Coast in the 1920s, and that helped solidify the Southern California region as the biggest metro area west of the Mississippi. When you have 20% of the nation's goods moving through one port, and even more when you combine the adjacent port of Long Beach, that can have real effects on city planning. How do you get goods out of the port, through the metro area, and onto the wider nation? That's a topic of a bonus video I posted over on Nebula. Signing up for Nebula is a great, super affordable way of supporting me, as well as creators like Not Just Bikes, Stuart Hicks, Wendover Productions, and Real Life Lore. We all post bonus content over there that you can't find on YouTube. I have a video on adult businesses that I couldn't post on YouTube for obvious reasons, but I can over on Nebula. Nebula is great, and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high-quality, engaging documentaries. If you're into transportation and logistics, you'll enjoy Trains That Change the World, a CuriosityStream documentary that begins with an entire episode on goods movement. It's a great follow-up to this video. We have a deal where if you sign up to CuriosityStream using the link below, you'll get Nebula for free. That's not a free trial, but free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they're running a special deal where you can get the entire year for 26% off. That's less than $15 a year for CuriosityStream and Nebula. Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel as well as the dozens of other creators working to make Nebula a success. 
overall is just a really good deal too. So go click on the link on screen and get 26% off.